All right, so this game here um, is, is this your game, Juan Wenyan? So Rui Lopez Berlin defense. <laughs> All right, let us know if you're white or black. So in this position, by the way, guys, there have been some interesting games with bishop c6, d6, and then white eventually castling queenside. So um, we saw um, so we saw an Oparin versus Fedosiev game from the last round of the Russian Championships, and that is up on YouTube if you guys didn't see it in my YouTube account. I clipped it and put it up there. So we've seen some cool games recently with this line. There's also not um, Caruana beat Nakamura in that line this year, and Wei Yi beat Navara in that line this year. So that's an interesting thing. We might um, we might study that line someday. For now, castles d6, c3, castles h3, a6. Okay, so once black plays a6, white would have some justification if they chose to trade on c6, and they can also follow it up with d4. It's also nothing wrong with keeping the bishop. So I'd say it's probably 50-50, which you do. I don't think one is just better than the other. It's probably taste. I wonder if here you wouldn't prefer playing bishop b6. I don't know if you're like an opening theory still or anything, but bishop b6 is definitely playable because the point is that e4 is hanging, and on d takes e5, you're going to play knight takes e4. And this position is playable for black, it looks to me. You guys want it flipped? All right. Okay, so to me, not knowing any opening theory, I think that bishop b6, d5, knight e4 is probably playable. Um, so if it's playable, it's probably better than taking on e4. It's probably better than taking on d4 if it's playable, because taking on d4 just gives white the extra possibility of knight c3, right? Which is a, a strong active square for the knight for dealing with the threat on e4. Ah, and yeah, and Juan Wen Yan is saying he didn't actually consider Bishop B6 during the game, and if he had, he probably would have done it. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, yeah, keep track of how many E4s and E5s are hanging in the Rui Lopez, because a lot of times um, you can leave a pawn hanging and then get it back on the other one, so yeah. So there's that. Queen C2 is played over Knight C3. Which surprises me, but I guess he's thinking the incidental threat on c6 is going to annoy you slightly. There's nothing really bad looking about this move. It slightly weakens d4, but you can't play bishop g4 because he's already got h3 in. So that's partly what h3 is about. Sort of still preparing to play d4 without losing control of this square here. Um, otherwise, I would definitely ignore queen c6 and play bishop g4 here, right? Um, but for for whatever reason, I'm not going to get into it. My feeling is knight c3 would be even slightly better. I don't know. If he plays queen c2, let's see if you can take advantage of it at all. So you defended c6. I wonder if you can't just play rook to e8. And then if he has to defend knight c3, then he didn't actually make you defend this pawn. So then you could just leave your bishop here, or you could put it wherever you want, or you could continue waiting to find out where it's going. Uh, maybe he'd play rook to e1. Oh, what if bishop g5? That could be a move you were afraid of. Yeah, I'm thinking rook e1, but let's have a quick look at bishop g5. So on bishop g5... Yeah, the annoying thing is I want to play h6, takes, takes, queen c6, and then just move this bishop, and then hopefully attack these pawns. Oh, and for a second I couldn't find a square for my bishop, but if you want 
enough, then perhaps you can find what you need, right? Bishop h3, I found the square for this bishop. Um, point was, my rooks were hanging, but I have this counter threat on d4, so I want to bring this out and get time. So here, and I guarantee you black has a good position here, right? I think you would guarantee you that as well. Um, he's got the bishop pair out, and white's development is very, very poor. So, yes, chess beast, you got it. All right, so then your other question would be, what if white drops back and you go here and here and here? And my answer is, yes, yes, do this. Totally good. Look, this bishop is like really well restrained here. Because he's already played h3, there's some threat of you taking on g3 and him being weak on this diagonal. Um, these moves weaken light squares. So that can be an issue in some cases, but here you've got an unopposed light squared bishop. So... You know, in a position like this, I don't think you have any real, like, weakness issue on the king side. So you can definitely play h6, g5 if they go for bishop, g5. Definitely. So rook e8 is playable. Definitely playable. Doesn't... Passes the test of not, like, losing to anything. White can play e5 in response and then take on c6. But we don't even really need to calculate this too hard because this will surely open enough light square diagonals for your for your bishop and you have enough lead in development that this will work out. Um, so I can promise you that without calculation if you like. Um, and we could do the variations if we had more time. But um, they, the variations are there waiting to be found. Idea night before. Something like this. Anyway, another day. <laughs> so bishop d7, you play. This is all minor stuff. Um, It's all minor little details that make small differences. I think one of the main things that you should be looking at every move is e5 from white. Because if you have to take this way, your pawn structure on the queen side gets a lot gets a lot worse. So you always want to be able to answer e5 by moving your knight and possibly letting him take on d6, but you don't want to have to take on e5 yourself. Okay, so that's definitely a thing to be looking at here. Um is you should have been looking at e5 every move. I don't know if you were, but there it is. Here. Yeah, here. It's kind of a typical Rui Lopez position, right? White's given up the bishop pair, but you've got this cramped and kind of slightly weak pawn structure here. You're always thinking to answer e5 with knight e5. Great. So you're doing that right. You were looking at the right move and you had the right plan. Um, Now I wonder if like e5 knight d5 could get annoying i mean can he grab this pawn somehow nah you've got stuff you've got this you've got this i don't know if you saw them but those are the key details at that particular moment um i guess an important question is what to do with your queen and rook and in my experience, you kind of want your queen on the B file and your rook backing up this rook, as we talked about from another um, e-pawn opening the other day. I would say this in general, Juan Wen Yan, I think your position is a little bit worse here. And um, I, mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying like you're playing bad or anything, but it seems like White's, White still has an has a bit of an advantage here. And if he does, it might mean that this choice of trading on d4 was a big deal. Because not only did we give him this c3 square for his knight, but you opened the c file against these pawns. So I wonder if you play bishop b6, how would White have dealt with this? You know, how might the game have gone differently? Like, I would play rook e8 for White. Now are you obliged to trade and get into the same kind of position, or can you just hold e5? What do you think? I mean, it looks like to hold e5, you have to allow 
DE and these doubled pawns. If you go here, takes, takes, knight, come in here. Um, I'm pretty bad at the Rui Lopez myself, unfortunately. This is all like stuff that I've been trying to learn and failing at for a long time. It still feels to me like you're a little bit worse here, so I don't know whether I could say if this is preferable or not to what you did. But that's the major consideration, is do you need to, is is it better for you to exchange or to hold the strong point, right? I mean, you can definitely play bishop b6 first, but it just um, it just delays the question for a second. They play rookie one, and the big question for you is are you trading or defending? And I don't honestly know what you're supposed to do. Maybe because this knight is not being so good. Maybe you should do it this way. And then if they take, you want to trade off one extra knight, go into this position. But the thing is, once you retreat your knight to d7, you have like no pressure on these squares. He's in no hurry to, to do anything with it. Um, it's not clear what, what you do next to improve your position. And he will bring the knight towards g3, f5, I think. So I'm not sure if that changes things, but I feel like you're a little bit worse here, which, you know, happens as black. I like where you moved your queen. I think I'd go to b7 next. Um, I think you're doing this very nicely. Oh, but if you go to b7, then on e5, knight d5, you'd lose the d6 pawn. And he, so you'd have to trade. You can also go to a7, possibly. Interesting. Yeah, but this doesn't feel right to me. I think you're struggling a little bit here to find space for, to find space for your pieces, maybe. How about this? If they actually go for e5, take, take, knight d5, bishop d2, yeah, it's a little bit worse. Yeah, you've seen queen b8 before, so you knew about the idea. Very good. Um. Yeah, queen b7, e5 is slightly unpleasant, I think, this line that I was just looking at. So I don't know exactly what you should do here. This move seeming pretty strong because it makes like e5 a little bit more annoying. I guess this is your main alternative to what you did. I mean, there's no other way to like move your pieces, really. So this is the big question. Um, I mean, this is like playable because you can, you know, blockade the light squares. This pawn would rather be back on e4 now that he's gotten this pawn structure changed. It is hard for him to make progress. You're right about that. It's not like atrocious in that sense. It's very hard for white to make progress. It's just, um, you know, your position is not like a peach. But yeah, I mean, you can totally just play this position. You just put your rook here and you just sit and you're acceptably solid. Yeah. So it's playable, that option. A3, bishop e6. Bishop b6. And you come back. Huh. Yeah, this is very good for you that you're able to get your rook out. I was suspicious of the a3, b4 idea from him. So now he finally goes for that. Pew. G4. 
Jeez, what more could you ask for than that bishop on d5? My. That is nice. Yeah, I mean, he finally just played e5 kind of out of frustration, right? And it's even worse than it was before. Dang. But d5 is generally bad. You just trade and come back. So your bishop's pretty good on e6. Yeah. So, I mean, a3, b4 is like a bad idea on his part. And it's nice to see that you can also just play bishop e6 at some point if you want to. Because e d5, you're happy to trade and come back. And on e5, it just makes it even easier to play knight d5. Um, yeah, so I guess you're just waiting here and you're okay against what, well, a3, b4 was bad. Maybe he could come up with something better. But this move here is basically just frustration. I mean, I know he knows it isn't good because he hasn't played it the last several moves because he knew it was bad, and now he's just doing it because he just is frustrated about this being bad. So now he's got... It just means he's got two new problems now. And, yep, open that up. Big advantage for black now. Big advantage for black just with the bishop pair. Huh, why does he go for this? Is he trying to, like, sack on h6 or something? That doesn't even look good. Oh, I guess he is, because he's lifted his rook for rook g3. He didn't even defend this. He's just going for some kingside thing. So it gets messy here, because this thing is conceded. Why not g4 instead of e5? That's like a plan for white. g4 to play g5? Totally reasonable. Totally reasonable. You don't see people doing that very often. So I don't have a ton of data on it, but my sense is in general, you can play g4, g5 in a position where the center is stable and black doesn't have any counters, which they really don't. The problem here is that once black has achieved a5 and is gonna open this rook, um, g4 is not gonna be good anymore. It's just like too late. But as a plan for white to have tried instead of a3, b4, right? If we go here, instead of a3, b4 and play like g4, g5, that's pretty reasonable. I think that might be a plausible way to play this position. Yeah. So it would have been an option. Okay, so he goes so he goes for this attack. Bishop g5. You just dodge out of that as well. And now he sacks. Um, so let's see how committed he was to sacking. If he goes knight e3 instead, I'm guessing you take on b4. Now you can trade off your monster bishop, but he's down a pawn and d4 is under pressure and he has no counterplay. Yeah, so this h5 kind of, everything he did was just set up to take on h6 and play rook g3, and now he can't figure out what to do with that. Um... Maybe instead of bishop f6, play knight f6? Is that at all better than what he did? Seems better. And Wan Wen Yan confirms that apparently Knight F6 was winning. Yeah. I mean, I'm not seeing much for black here. It's pretty brutal. Like, the only thing I'm seeing is to try and run your king to D7 to survive for a while on, on D7, right? So, like, you know, you do something like this. And... Check, take... Queen g5, maybe queen g5, maybe just rook g3, threatening check and rook g8. So now your king can't continue going. Yeah, rook g3 prevents king e8. Uh, and it even threatens possibly rook g8, king g8, queen h6 in some cases, depending what move black plays here. So this looks very bad so basically h5 doesn't stop the sack at all 
right? The h5 move you played. I mean, he was threatening to sack on f6, but he can come to f6 and it's exactly the same, right? He doesn't care about, like, taking the pawn or not. He's just trying to come into one of these squares and get rid of the g-pawn. So, so h5 basically, whoops, basically just loses you a tempo with knight f6. Okay, so I see in the chat you've said that apparently you should have just played rook b4 instead of h5. That makes sense. I mean, you just have to get your pieces into the game as they can, and this is your plan, right? So, um, rook takes b4. Let's see how good or bad this is. Um, his threat apparently was bishop takes h6, right? I mean, for one thing, you could just leave that there and play rook d4 now. You could also take it and test whether or not it's whether or not it's winning for him. But I'm going to try this move. Just getting my rook into the game. I'm going to try this first, you know, before getting into anything super complicated. Um, and now maybe here, keeping his rook on the board, and then here, covering things. So I let him take h6 the way you couldn't keep him out of these two squares. But I'm not actually moving this pawn. Um, so I still have some control over these squares, even though I'm not using that control just yet. And you've got all these pieces in the in the game now for like counter threats. You know, you can go rook takes g4 in some case. Um, yeah. That is instructive, right? Yeah, I mean, you've got the queenside pawn majority as one way to eventually win the game. Also, just like the raking of your bishops this way. I mean, you could win the fight on the king side once you get your pieces there. So, knight g4, h5, a mistake. And suddenly, he has his chance. He doesn't play it. You take here. Queen g5, queen f8. And now he's attacking with a queen and bishop against a queen and two pawns. He's not going to break through. Hg4, de5, de5. Huh. Huh, this is a complicated counter sack. I mean, I'm not sure that you like win by force here, do you? If you play something like this, check in this. I mean, were you were you like completely winning with this option? Hmm, you were gonna get mated if you didn't go for this, and this at least prevents him from playing rook h3. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I mean, this certainly is playable for black. You're doing, you're in the game, but you're not really avoiding checkmate. Okay. So queen f8, hg4. So you said rook h3 is going to back rank mate you or something? Well, let's test it. Show me the checkmate. Rook h3. So I guess you're going to play here, and then if this, this. I could do this, but you can keep your rook like this. Now you've only got space for your queen. Oh, I guess you could also go rook h2 if you want to leave more checkmating options for your queen, and it covers this kind of a counterattack. Um... <clears throat> if you go for this, this still seems to do it. Hmm. So you're still under like a heavy attack here, even with his bishop f6? Yeah. Still a scary move coming. 
So this is officially scary. I mean, you're just everything you have is stuck, and he can just come here. Yeah, this is this is <clears throat> this is still super scary. So Bishop F6 locks your pieces away from the king side, and when you take this, he still has this. So H5 is almost like just a complete wasted move, right? Like, because what you really need to do is not capture one of his pieces on the king side, but get your pieces over here somehow. Huh. Bishop F6. And here, 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 rook g3, here, pawn takes, and you win as well. I mean, you lose as well. White wins as well. <laughs> this position here is like an actual position from his game. White has just played bishop f6. He tried to defend with hg4. And now we're realizing that he was in major danger. Wow, this h5 really didn't work out. The rook on e6 is a good defensive piece. I suppose another plausible option for you here, as well as the rook before that we looked at, would have been rook g6. Getting on this side of anything coming to f6, so you're always covering your king on the g file. Right? This could have been a very good move as well here. Um... Well, props to him for coming up with this like rook d3, knight g4. Um, from a position where he was obviously like pretty like upset about what was going on here. Maybe after rook d3, you could also consider queen h4. I just throw that out there as another option for you. Um, queen h4, because it it covers this h6 sack. And if he plays bishop g3, then his rook can't go to g3. And that's really not his plan. Um, and then you can probably keep your king queen on the king side like this. Um, and you could play rook to g3. But if he plays rook to g3, now his move order has let you play this move quickly, right? And on bishop h6, you have queen g3. And instead of spending time on rook b4, you can follow up with rook a2. So here you're sort of countering a little bit more. Um, so that's another consideration is bringing your queen to the side of the board. Rook e6, right? Trying to get a rook into the side of the board. An interesting point of like rook g6, just avoiding getting locked out by the classic f6 sacrifice, right? So making sure you've got someone over on this side of the board. Um, again, maybe queen h4 here is also a move putting your queen on that area of the board um, just so you've got the total number of defenders to let most of these attacks bounce off of you. Interesting. So the funny thing is you played the part of the game where you were suffering. I think this is a good, this is a good thing to remember. And one of the points people of analyzing your games is not just to find out, oh, this move was better than that move, whatever. One of the real points of analyzing your games is to start noticing some patterns about yourself and to start understanding yourself, okay? You analyze your games one at a time, and after analyzing a bunch of games, you start to notice some things about yourself. These can be useful to notice. So, um, you know, I gave the general thought about what I'd noticed with Hicket Nunk about calculating variations that were challenging for him and not at the time to make decisions by calculation. Here I noticed something very interesting with you, Wan Wen Yan, which is when you had a bad position, you actually weren't worried. You were playing like super high level positional defensive chess 
and you were never very concerned and you thought about the position from your perspective and your opponent's perspective you thought about what he could do and you were like preventing it so that's the sort of prophylactical way of prophylactics um approach that like karpov and petrosian were so famous for and really not giving him something to do but once he played this bad a3 b4 and like e5 and you completely capitalized on it and by capitalized i mean this I mean, this bishop and this rook and this weak pawn, right? And you've got this like amazing position. And then in your opponent's time trouble, you started making, you started playing worse than you'd played when you had a bad position, right? Once you've got a, like a winning position and your opponent in time trouble, somehow you're giving him chances suddenly, underestimating his moves. Suddenly he's playing moves that you aren't planning on where before you were predicting his stuff, right? So that's that's an interesting thing to notice I think you can you can see for yourself or notice for yourself over many games whether or not that's a pattern for you I can't say for sure but I think it's useful always to try and pull out and notice those kinds of things and they don't all lead somewhere sometimes it's just like that's what you did that one day you just happened you know, it could be that you got tired and so you played a worse move, not because of like you're worse in a certain kind of position or anything. But if you look at 10 or 20 of your games, you'll start to see which patterns are actually emerging and know some things about yourself. All right, so that's what we've got 